Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today, my guest uh, actually is an extraordinary guest uh, directly from Singapore, Parak Khanna. That's uh, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, Parak Khanna is an ad. I need, I need the help of the book to read all the titles that he's holding and achievements that he has accomplished. So he's the managing partner of Future Map, a data-driven scenario planning and strategic advisory firm. Uh, a fellow at the Brookings Institute, Institution, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. And he holds many, many other titles uh, and, and has uh, written multiple books, two of which I've read myself, one of them twice. Uh, I'm in Connectography and uh, The Future is Asian. Uh, the Future is Asian is uh, the, the last uh, book of yours, and Connectography was the, the, the former one. And I know that Parak is, Kana is working now on the, the new book. Could you tell us a little bit more about what this is about? Sure. So my next book actually is finished already. It would have been published this year, but we're holding it because of the pandemic. Uh, but it's really about the future of human geography. I've written a lot about... Um, infrastructure, geopolitics, many dimensions of strategic geography, but I haven't written an entire book about the future of human geography, which is demographics, ethnographics, uh, our relationship to the environment and to politics and so forth. So I set out with a fairly simple question, where will the world population be physically in the year 2050? And I've tried to reverse engineer that answer, looking at many drivers of human settlement patterns, migration, pandemic, climate change, geopolitics, economics, technology, and so forth. So that's the next book. And it will be released in uh, mid-2021. Now I understand why the motto in the Futurist Asian is for my five billion uh, neighbors, five billion neighbors. This is what I mean. So... I'm talking to the guy really who understands Eurasia uh, and uh, uh, my dear audience who is listening uh, knows that I also talk to, to Americans from uh, North America. So the perspective might be a little bit different. Uh, uh, you know, Parak, you're traveling ar around, you talk to many people uh, by many magazines and I remember one of them, I remember the name. You were uh, sort of titled uh, one of the most influential intellectuals uh, uh, on planet. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what do you think? Where are we in terms of the Eurasian consolidation? Uh, you're sitting now in Singapore. I'm sitting on the other side of the world, still in Eurasia. But this one that is more landlocked, uh, it's not a hub of everything like Singapore is. And this is all exactly about uh, connectivity. So what's the future of Eurasia? Then? Well, you know, I look at systems, right? And uh, our regions, such as Europe in particular, form a coherent system. And a system, the definition is the intensity of the relationship between the units, the states. So Europe obviously is our most integrated system in the world. Asia is becoming a system. And that's what the future is Asian was about, was this process of Asianization. Not a beginning, not an end, a pathway, a journey towards Asia as a more coherent system. Eurasia, has not really been a system for uh, quite some time, especially in the post-Cold War decades, the last, which is the last 30 years, you had Europe grappling with its own uh, challenges of uh, widening and deepening simultaneously. And both of them have their limits. Asia was coming out of poverty and Cold War division and also struggling to create its own internal system dynamics. Now, in the last 10 years or so, you have a return to Eurasia. And to me, that is the return of the Afro-Eurasian world. And that's part of what I talk about in the Asia book. The pre-colonial world, the pre-Cold War world of the 15th and 16th centuries was a time when Eurasia had the flourishing Silk Roads. So... Are we recreating that in a 21st century way, of course, in terms of modernity, technology, obviously new and different actors and tensions? So is there a Eurasian system? Yes, because Europe and Asia trade more with each other than they do with North America. 
right? The, the largest axis of commercial relations on the planet Earth is the relationship between the European Union and Asia. And the European Union trades more with China uh, than America trades with China and so forth. You're seeing growing foreign investment. You're seeing more flows of people, obviously more infrastructure being built, more free trade agreements, diplomatic relationships, and so on and so on and so on. Let's remember that the definition of a system has nothing to do with whether it's peaceful or violent. Something I always have to emphasize. Europe has been a system for 2,000 years, and it's been a violent system for all but the last 75 years of those 2,000 years, right? More or less, just to put a big picture paint on things. So whether or not we have peace or rivalry or conflict within Asia or within Europe or between Europe and Asia doesn't matter. It's about the intensity of relations. In fact, war and conflict are proof that you have a system. If two countries are next to each other but ignore each other, then they have nothing to do with each other. They're not a system. They're just neighbors. They just share geography. So when you have India and China colliding on multiple borders, you're seeing how these Asian powers are actually becoming a more interdependent uh, system and a more intense system. So systemness is about intensity. It's not about quality. It's not normative. It's analytic. So Eurasia is definitely becoming more and more system-like. And I think we've come a long way in the last 30 years and we'll probably continue on that path in the next 30 years. If you think about the population sizes of Europe and Asia, the complementarity of the economies and other factors. Interesting. And don't you think that uh, I, I, I sort of agree and we have been... Uh, uh, sort of uh, saying that o over here for many, many years. And, but, 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 you know, if you take a look at the great ocean revolution 500 years ago, I, what, what you're trying to describe now and what you describe in your books and, uh, and what the Chinese are doing with the New Silk Road and, you know, Zenization, as you say, and connectivity across the landmass of Eurasia uh, is... Uh, supposed to change the correlation of influence and power and uh, the places where the richness is being built. Yeah? So what would you, what would be your answer to that? Will that happen really? Or there will be vested interest by the so far, so far powers and uh, institutions that will make sure that nothing is changing under the sun? Well, things are always changing. So, I mean, the notion that there may be status quo powers doesn't change the fact that the status quo never holds, right? So it's like saying that because America doesn't want China to rise, China won't rise. But of course, China has been rising and China is rising. So it's kind of irrelevant what the status quo power thinks if its a vision or intent is not effective. It's like, like I served in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? I was advising the US uh, military. The United States wanted Iraq and Afghanistan to become peaceful, democratic, pro-American democracies, right? Uh, that didn't happen, right? So just because you want something, it doesn't mean you get it. So I'm interested in what's happening and what will happen, not so much whether someone wants it or doesn't. And this is sort of when uh, we talk about Asia, very often in Europe, people say, so when will the world become, you know, Asian? Because we don't really see, we don't really, you know, understand that in Europe. And I say, well, the fact that you don't understand it is kind of irrelevant, right? Something is or it isn't. Most of the world population is in Asia. Half the world's GDP is in Asia, right? Uh, so whether or not you realize it in England or in France doesn't really matter to any Asian, right? The majority of the human beings in the world are Asian and they know that they live in an Asian world. If you don't get the memo in uh, you know Toronto, Canada, guess what? Nobody cares. So I'm being very blunt here, but it's this matter of perspective. But even if people have contrasting perspectives based on varying degrees of knowledge, that doesn't change facts. So when it comes to power shifts, it's the same thing. So one of the central questions that I don't think is a question at all is about unipolarity versus multipolarity. You know, and people saying, well. When will the world be multipolar? Or how multipolar is or Well, of course, the world is already quite multipolar. So why would people still pretend 
that we are in the early phases of a power transition when the power has transitioned, right? You already have, based on economics and other variables, a quite, a, quite a diffuse structure of power and capacity in the world today. Of course, it, it, your arguments are very convincing, and I, I will play a, you know, a sort of a, a, a contesting game a little bit, so, because I want to approximate for Europeans the perspective of Asia, and uh, I've been to Asia so many times that I understand what you're trying to say, and we're trying to do the same here at Strategy in Future, so that people sort of catch up with the reality. Yeah? Uh, but, I, you know, catching up with reality is always a very difficult process. There are old mental maps and the old, uh, you know, things that you have in your head, especially if, if they have been there for 500 years, okay? And uh, uh, this is uh, the West, you know, that's what we call the West, and uh, it's sometimes very difficult to, to give the arguments why it's happening like that. And uh, uh, still saying that, uh, let's take a look at what Trump administration was doing and the Americans are, are doing. They sort of seem to understand that they are about to lose and they started to ch try to change the structure of the relationship between Asia and America, between Eurasia and the world ocean, as I say, in grand strand, uh, and strategy. Do you, do you still think that the, the Eurasia may really beat the world ocean that has been in charge for the last 500 years? Uh, you know what I mean by the world ocean, the connectivity around it. Do you think that can really beat? Because the Americans, to whom I speak often, they, I mean, a few of them think that they might lose. The world ocean is unbeatable. What do you th well, how would you answer that? It's it's a very much a false dichotomy, quite frankly. You know, heartland versus rimland. Uh, you know, territorial versus oceanic power. America having the majority of the world's aircraft carriers. When it comes to the perspective from Asia on those issues, you know, China does not have to conquer South America to be a global power. What you have to understand is that to be a global a globally relevant power you actually have to be an Asian power because in Asia is where the economic activity is, where the growth is, where the innovation is, where the demographics are, and a lot of where natural resources are as well. So the question, so if you go back to European colonialism, let's remember that Portugal and the Netherlands and Spain and, and England were not global powers until they became Asian powers, right? Until they had colonies in Asia. When you cease to have power in Asia, you are not a global power anymore. You are a local power. You are a provincial power. You are a European state and nothing more. However, when you are an Asian state already, like India or China, if you are powerful in Asia, you are powerful in the world because most of what is happening in the world is in Asia. You see what I'm saying? Of course. So it's apples and oranges. The metrics, the yardsticks, the goals, the ambitions are entirely different because for you, you have to be influential here on my side of the world to be global. For me, if I'm an Asian power, I don't have to matter in Ireland. I don't have to matter in Peru. I just have to matter in Asia. And that's actually not something new. As I say, that is actually the, that is what is proven by the entire 16th century process of competition among Europeans. You have global colonies, whether North America or Asia. So you can also still be an Atlantic power. You can be relevant, right, in, in, the, in the transatlantic realm. That doesn't make you a global power because you're relevant only in a very limited part of the world economy. Whereas in Asia, you have the majority of, again, the human population, world economic activity here. So again, it's, it's, uh, it's unfair. The, 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 the playing field is tilted so heavily towards Asia and people don't even necessarily understand it. Now, I don't think it's something to fear, let me add, because Europe is the region that is maximally taking advantage of this situation. Again, if you are European today and a European Union member today, you trade more with Asia than you do with the United States, right? You and I may be old enough to still remember a transatlantic dominated world. I grew up in America and in Germany, actually, and I spent my teenage years as a transatlantic kid. 
But that said, so even in our short lifetimes, an incredible amount has shifted in that uh, in that Asian direction. Yeah, I, of course, I will ask you a question about the future of Europe, but uh, let me add one more uh, question because I really want to to understand all the details and make the audience understand your perspective about this connectivity. Because, you know, in this uh, the last three minutes of our conversation, actually we talked about connectography because uh, this is where the sinews of power uh, are. Um, and uh, uh, I asked about the world ocean connectivity, you know, ocean connectivity, and you, you, you were saying other connectivities that are here and technologically will be there. And uh, But the question is where the power is really... Uh, where the power really is. Is it about the, I wonder what your perspective is. Is it uh, still within the, you know, the US who is controlling strategic flows by US dollar system, by the military presence in, in the remnant of Eurasia, by actually communication monopolies, uh, you know, from internet to, to undersea cables and uh, uh, shipping lanes of communication. Or it's already connectivity across uh, landmass of Eurasia because you're right, population, GDP, but still, just like mechanisms of power seem to be within West or not. So this is the uh, the critical question I wanted to ask. So there's a couple of answers. The first is that everything has become a marketplace. There are no global monopolies. No, Huawei is not a global monopoly in 5G. It has less than 30% global market share, and that share is going to go down because of the pressure against it and the uh, opportunities that is creating for Nokia and Ericsson and NTT and so forth. So even there, when it comes to Facebook, Google, Twitter, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn and so forth, you actually have a very large number of national champion platforms and full stack ecosystems for identity payment and so forth. So just because you have a global company, a multinational company, particularly the American uh, social media and e-commerce companies, they are global, but they're not global monopolies. They may be monopolistic actors inside the United States. And because the United States is a big domestic market, they are therefore very large companies. But Apple's market share in China is less than 2% of mobile handsets. The world's largest handset manufacturer and distributor is Samsung. Samsung has doubled the global market share of Apple. So let's not forget that. Apple is only larger by market um, because it uh, is an American company with the liquidity of the U.S. stock exchange behind it and because its phones are a little bit more expensive. Right. So let's let's not confuse, um, you know, size in one's home market with this notion of a global monopoly. Global monopolies are almost impossible. And you see this now in many spheres. If you want to talk about American power, you have to remember that power does not rest in place. Power rests in context. Right. And connectivity is that context. So it's not about the dollar per se, because actually you have four major currency zones in the world that are more or less self-contained, self-sufficient, that hold most of their own debt onshore with their own investors and citizens and in their own currency. And that's Japan, China, Europe, and America, right? America, the American dollar is the one that's most globalized. So the larger share of reserves globally is in the dollar. But now you see the marketplace evolving there as well, with both China and Europe talking about having their own um, you know, crypto instruments, denominating trade in their own currency, encouraging global central banks globally to diversify their reserves to hold their currency, trying to circumvent the dollar as in denomination of trade. So even that's becoming competitive. When it comes to military, again, there's static, there's latent power, static power, and then there's the effectiveness of that power. And when you look at American military power, uh, which again, I've seen very much firsthand. Um, of course, it's, it's uh, awe inspiring in terms of latent power, but in terms of coercive capability, it's a bit less effective than uh, Americans would want, right? Um, and so you have to go step by step by step. Now, again, like energy is an extremely important aspect of power, right? America has become the world's largest oil and gas producer and one of the largest exporters. No country can have a monopoly on global hydrocarbon supplies because America has entered that market. What used to be controlled by OPEC and particularly Russia and Saudi Arabia is no longer. 
because America has countered what used to be a monopoly. So to be honest, there really are no global monopolies. There's no force that can't be resisted. There is no sector or technology where there is not an alternative. And the last frontier in all of that to, for many people is semiconductors, right? Because this is one area where uh, there is a genuine effort to restrict the absolute best technology from China. Uh, and it's a very live issue right now. Export controls, uh, blocking the sale of you know, chip designs, all of these kinds of things. But eventually, China will, of course, get there, right? Eventually. Some would say artificial intelligence. But of course, when it comes to artificial intelligence, the shoe is on the other foot. Because many people think that the leader in AI is not America at all. Many people think it's China. And the answer is, it's both. And it's others, too. Because the law of technology diffusion is the most powerful law. India is a huge AI center. India is now investing in quantum computing, too. Many countries have space-based uh, you know, satellite systems, navigation, weapons, and so forth, or will. So you would have to really prove that there is some incumbent monopoly in certain areas. A lot of it is more psychological than real. And quite frankly, that's what genuinely worries American strategists today, is that they feel that they have more to lose than the challenging powers feel. So what, what, how would you uh, describe the future of Eurasia and especially Europe? And uh, on top of that, what Europe should do now? Because Europe is at the crossroads. As you know, you receive many questions uh, on, about your opinion. What Europe should do? Join hands with the transatlantic vision of the world and protect the vested interest and the role of the United States and its primacy, deglobalize, ban Huawei, or it should really join Eurasian uh, sort of future and uh, actually enter the uncharted territory that they haven't known for 500 years with this land mass orientation and the completely new supply chains. What would you do? Well, the answer is both, right? Because what smart countries or powers do is what I call multi-alignment, right? Multi-alignment. That's the term that I coined in my, my first book uh, called The Second World. And what I was arguing is that in, unlike the Cold War situation, where powers are forced to choose, are you with one side or the other side? Today, in a post-colonial and post-war environment that we are in right now, countries don't want to choose one side or the other. They want to play all sides off each other and also assert their own sovereignty, autonomy, and so forth. So that's the number one thing, is for Europe to be more self-confident and not to choose one side or the other, but to be to act in its own best interest as strongly as possible. So in some areas, that means, of course, uh, more cooperation with the United States. So let's, again, take the economy. Europeans have already sent messages to Joe Biden saying, you know, we want to go back to that trade liberalization agenda. Please bring down your protectionist barriers. We have a lot of cars that we want to sell you, right? Yeah. So that's an, an example. Another is, a sensible cooperation among financial regulators to join forces and the financial sectors to push for China's capital account liberalization and to uh, join forces in pushing against China in terms of intellectual property theft in the World Trade Organization. Obviously, a very sensible area of cooperation. For Europe and America to agree that China should be opening its financial markets does not mean that Europe is somehow taking a backseat to America. Europe is going to make a lot more money off of that process than America is going to make. It is your pension funds that represent something like 70% of the world's outstanding liabilities. You are going to wind up investing. You, as Europe and Europeans, are going to invest a lot more in Asian capital markets than America will, right? So we have to think about these things as selective, issue-based, opportunistic. Sure, why not block Huawei? Actually, what it does is, again, it creates a marketplace for some of your own companies to thrive. Sometimes America does things that make you feel that you are subservient to it, but they make you better off. Think about the Iraq War of 2003. Uh, back when Europe was importing more oil and gas, who got the oil from Iraq? Right. Everyone says that it was America's war for oil, but America doesn't buy Iraqi oil anymore. It doesn't need it. Europe gets Iraqi oil. Right. So always be opportunistic about about things like this and, and do what's in your your best interest as Europe. That would be you know the first answer. And especially because 
from an intellectual standpoint, European perspectives on issues like whether to engage or isolate are fundamentally on the right side of history. You know, most more Europeans feel that you need to engage with Russia and settle the outstanding boundary disputes, especially in areas where you're not going to win them back. Uh, rather than pretending that, you know, having sanctions hang over Russia forever is a smart idea. Because, of course, that just pushes Russia more towards China, which is not good for anyone. Um, same thing applies to Iran uh, and, and other dilemmas. So I think that the European approach is well-founded empirically. It is certainly in Europe's interest. It's probably more in the Western interest for America to follow Europe's lead on many of these issues than the reverse. So I would end where I began, which is much more European self-confidence is what I would like to see. I understand your, your proposition about opportunistic choices, but still, Australia chose otherwise under Prime Minister Morrison, uh, and it takes some you know, beating from China. It, it joined the US camp in terms of you know, trying to curb uh, China whatever that means. And uh, Singapore, I listened carefully to what your prime minister, prime minister of Singapore was saying, I think in May, that uh, the Singapore does want to make choices. Uh, uh, so, but on the other hand, when I traveled to the United States, I, I, I kept hearing from the Americans that you will have to ch choose sides. You need to, I mean, we will force you to. So I understand your concept, that would be perfect, especially for small nations that don't want to choose. They want to have open connectivity, they want to have globalization, they want to have access to markets. But what if great powers ban them from having access to global market and control the connectivity that connects them to and the regulations connecting them to the global market? Well, so in terms of this choosing sides, you know, the fact is that, uh, again, the smart countries are finding ways not to choose sides. And just because, you know, going back to the first discussion we had, just because one power wants something, it doesn't mean it's going to get it, right? You know, most of my recent essays have been about China doesn't actually get what it's want, what it wants. Some of the most important issues right now, and I've been doing a series of, of arguments about this based on the Asia book and what I'm seeing right now, the pushback against China is perhaps more powerful than China. And we spend more time focusing on this idea that China will get what it wants because it has a long-term plan. Uh, but of course, China, in fact, gets pushed back all the time. And the same thing happens uh, to the United States. So when it comes to the regulatory issues, let's remember that you know, it's Europe that's trying very hard to break up the American technology monopolies. There's a new set of uh, antitrust measures against Amazon, against Facebook, against Google, pretty much every single week, it seems coming out of Europe. You know, GDPR is becoming a global data privacy standard um, and so forth. So I think these issues wind up being a lot more uh, complicated, uh, I would say, than, um, than the kind of superficial view tends to suggest. So let's fast forward to 50 years. Let's, let's have 50 years. What would Eurasia look like? And I'm also touching a little bit upon your most recent comments that I was listening about demographics and so on, robotization. How would you describe the future of Eurasia if, uh, assuming that you're right, in that globalization is inevitable? Well, I mean, 50 years is a very long time horizon. I actually just finished a 50-year scenario exercise with my team for uh, a government in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, I think if you were to do an honest assessment that takes into account the current trajectory of things like climate change and uh, some of the major demographic disruptions underway, such as the kind of leveling of the world population, something that you can already feel very strongly in Europe, you would come up with a, a range of scenarios for what the future of Eurasia is, but not a confident answer, right? Especially given these significant uh, disruptions in demographics and, and climate change. So I tend to speak in terms of scenarios, especially when you're looking at a 50 year sort of time horizon. So we do know in 50 years, Eurasia will not have splintered apart physically, geologically. So maybe we don't have to worry about that. But when it comes to which geographies have um, you know, the, the demographics and the cl climatic stability 
uh, you know, that's going to be a different set of geographies. So I've been looking at finding what I call the climate oases, right? What are the places that are going to be livable, sustainable, uh, you know, circular economies? Uh, because let's remember, we don't really have to worry about the capacity for 3D printing and distributed engineering and fourth industrial revolution, right? These are commodities at this point, right? So the question is, where will human beings assemble into these viable, stable communities? And will it be a country like Russia? Is it going to be, you know, Sweden, Poland, right? What are going to be the countries that do the best job? And those countries may not have the same borders uh, today, uh, you know, is 50 years from now. You know, as you know, I'm, my, my work is in political geography very much. So to me, the map of the world is always changing. Look at Nagorno-Karabakh, right, in the Caucasus. Uh, so I don't actually believe that the borders of the year 2070 are going to be the borders of the year 2020, right, not even close. Um, so, you know, when you talk about Eurasia, I would say the future, it's going to be you know, a, quite a fluid space. One of the things that I have been looking at is the rise of what I call Asian Europeans, for example. One thing is clear to me, a lot more Asian people will live in Europe than right now. And you can already see that happening over the last 20 years and certainly play it forward. If you think about the labor shortages, if you look at current policies on importing labor, if you think about the populations necessary uh, to care for the elderly and to, uh, and to be part of the, the, uh, the workforce, you can see a lot more Asians coming to Europe right now. So I think that's an example of what we know is going to be the case. But I don't think that you can have a serious conversation about Eurasia 50 years from now and actually treat, you know, France, Germany, England, uh, you know, Sweden, Russia, uh, China, India as being exactly the same, but then everything else changes. And the trouble with, with, you know, very often conversations where we're trying to make forecasts is that our minds cannot handle complexity. So we hold most things equal and we change just one thing or another thing. And it just shows our own mental limitations. But real scenarios, realistic scenarios, are a far more complex uh, exercise. Okay, g given that this is you know true and uh, the future is always uncertain, so what would be the game changers? For example, technology that creates enhanced connectivity or creates open directions, uh, new directions. Um, usually in the history, the great revolutions of industrial revolutions were fueled by uh, uh, revolutionary disruption, uh, disruptions in the transportation, engines, uh, you know, connectivity. What would be the game changers that are coming or that are about to come? Well, there's no question that we are moving towards a world of more or less, you know, ubiquitous digital finance in everyone's hands and currencies or even, you know, not, not a common currency, but cryptocurrencies that allow for more or less the seamless transfer of capital, you know, whether it's Bitcoin or otherwise on the blockchain. So empowered individuals uh, financially is one of the trends that I think is very important because it gives people the confidence to divorce themselves from their national financial system. So, you know, moving uh, finance, mobile finance into the cloud and crypto finding it is a really, really seminal trend. The other is potentially divorcing nationality and mobility, because you know, as it was in the result as a result of the pandemic, the the power of a passport has shifted drastically. Right, America had 150 countries visa free access, then suddenly it had only 30 countries of visa free access. Right, so we now have to move towards a system where individuals are a granted mobility based on immunity and health, skills, uh, you know, financial security, criminal records, many things, but all of that also digitized, accessible to customs and border services and this kind of thing. So I think we're also going to see more mobility in that regard too. Um, some of the more terrestrial kinds of changes that I think are, are very substantial, obviously, are the... The, a, a change in how the water, food, and energy nexus kind of plays out. Because now if you think about the capacity for alternative and renewable energy being localized and portable, 
you think about the investments being made in localized food production, hydroponic, aquaponic, and these kinds of things, we can also have more self-sustainable uh, communities that depend less on global supply chains, right? And I think that is going to be uh, a pretty significant factor uh, as well. So when you talk about social upheavals of the past being driven by certain technologies, yes, but it didn't happen evenly, same place, same time globally, right? These things unfold more like dominoes depending on who is in the lead, right? The Industrial Revolution of England, uh, uh, United States, elsewhere, again, different time scales. So I think that uh, the question really is which ones, which countries have a vision, have a plan, are making the investments in adopting those technologies and preparing their populations accordingly, and which ones are not. Um, and that's, that's really the key question. Um, and, you know, what I, when I was reading your book on the connectivity and later I started dealing with space connectivity and the potential new economy in space, have you considered how the space-based uh, economy, even close to, to Earth, and, uh, you know, it's happening, by the way, you know, Internet and stuff, uh, can change the, what you were writing and then how it can influence your thinking? Well, you know, it's... It's another geography of connectivity, and it is another um, you know, platform or, or plane, if you will, of competitive connectivity, right, of, of competition. So you know, some people think of the connectivity argument as being in favor or biased towards peace and stability. And of course, that's not the argument that I make. The argument I make is that connectivity is the foremost instrument and tool of building influence. So space becomes, a, a, again, a, a geography of competitive connectivity because you can see the positioning of weapons or satellite networks, you know, which countries are managing which other countries, um, uh, uh, GPS systems and navigational systems and so forth. So that's what's happening right now. Uh, of course, as a domain, of course, for, for spreading uh, internet connectivity, right? And, and these kinds of things. So again, that's become an active arena same way that the oceans are, that land are, that, that the geography of industrial production and supply chains are, the geography of data centers. All of these are competitive infrastructural geographies. So space is a new one. You know, it's obviously um, a very novel one as well, but it isn't without uh, precedent because we've uh, you know, been in a world of uh, the sort of so-called space race uh, for quite some time. And the last question, as uh, we need to conclude shortly, uh, and you know, I'm asking this question, of course, as a European and also as a Pole who has had a, a difficult and troubled history with Russia. So what do you think of Russia in terms of its role and the situation and this uh, Eurasian consolidated uh, project of one supercontinent? Uh, how, would, how the Kremlin people will play this game? Well, I think those are two different questions, right? I mean, uh, Russia obviously is uh, what uh, what Halford Mackinder called the going concern of geopolitics. You cannot be a student of geography, political geography, or geopolitics without wrestling endlessly uh, with Russia, as I certainly have for for you know more than twenty years now. And um, so, the place of Russia becomes extreme, extraordinarily important in light of the uh, growing role of the Arctic in trade and commerce and military maneuvering, uh, Arctic settlements and habitation and agriculture, shortening the distance, obviously, of travel for trade, and so on and so forth. But let's remember that geopolitics has long been a northern hemispheric game. Now it moves even further north, so to speak, in terms of latitude. So Russia's role becomes very important. But what is Russia with each successive decade, right? Russia... You know, one of the things I've been writing about for a long time is that, you know, no country has had its geographic borders shift by greater distance in history than Russia, right? And even over a span of a couple of decades. If you think about the 17th century, Russia was growing at, uh, you know, 100 kilometers per week or something like that. Um, but of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia lost an extraordinary amount of uh, territory, the Russian Empire did. So what is the, that Russia? And I don't, again, a serious conversation about the future of Russia must acknowledge the demographics, 
the economics, the, the, the capacity that the state may or may not have to retain sovereign control over its full territory, or what the future governance of that vast geography may look like. There could be uh, uh, parts of Russia that are really very much co-governed by international energy companies and agricultural companies. There could obviously be large parts of Russia that are under the nominal, uh, you know, sort of um, direction of China and Chinese populations could, could grow substantially. So, you know, what is Russia is the essential question to answer for each increment of time horizon that you're looking at, because it could be a different Russia than the Russia we know. Now, I, I do have you know, spent quite a bit of time in Moscow and spoken to, to, uh, to officials there, you know, sequentially over the over recent uh, you know, decades. And, uh, and I feel that their grasp on all of these dynamics, the geographic, the political, economic, and so forth, has increased. I sense a, um, a new generation uh, of you know, fairly competent technocrats in charge of many aspects of the domestic economy and administration. And I think that's a good thing. That's part of the process of what has happened in quite a few post-Soviet republics and in post-colonial countries more generally. Um, so I actually think that Russia will manage itself uh, in some ways. Of course, the only issue it, it cannot control or has failed to control is its, uh, its, its, its uh, ethnic and native population, which is in freefall. Um, so the question becomes, what are the tools, human or technological, that they are going to use to maximize this vast territory? And I think that what I see today is the semblance of a plan to do something about that, whether it is the Far East, whether it is the Altai, whether it is Siberia, whether it is the Arctic, I see a semblance of a plan and I actually see it unfolding infrastructurally in their investments um, much more than I saw five or 10 years ago. Thank you very much. And, uh, our guest was Farak Khanna. Thank you, Farak. Uh, stay with us. Uh, uh, strategy in future, Jacek Bartosiak. Uh, see you soon. Mm -hmm.